But, uh, thanks, Cahir. Look, I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Morden and Mr. Butler for um, their um, presentation and for their, their um, forthright answering of questions. I, I think what you know, we're dealing really time about fuel fraud. I mean, the emphasis is, is on the petrol stretching because people's engines break down. But I think that the, the diesel fraud and diesel on is a much bigger problem. And I think the biggest victim in all this is the taxpayer because of the, the amount of revenue that's been lost. And I was just wondering, it, it, has any figure been put on what the estimated loss of revenue is arising out of fuel fraud in general, you know, for last year or the year before? Um, I, um, you also said there that three million gallons of flounder fuel was seized. Now, um, you know, was there successful prosecutions arising out of that seizure and uh, what kind of penalties were imposed? Uh, and uh, was there uh, was was there imprisonment or was it fines or in in that case? You also mentioned that um, uh, you know that there is a, a criminal network involved in the in the whole fuel fraud uh, and fuel laundering business, and that it's a cross border fraud, and that um, the agencies uh, on both sides of the border are trying to tackle it. And you did say that some of the criminal elements involved were people who had a political involvement and there have been some high profile cases of people who um, were, were uh, laundered um, uh, fuel was discovered but I, I'd like to ask you about your, your the role of the Gardaí and your cooperation with the Gardaí and how to deal with that uh, given that the, the nature of some of the criminal elements that are involved that they, 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 they may have a paramilitary background and I'd also like to know if the Criminal Assets Bureau are involved, if, if that any of the assets of these people who are considered to have accumulated millions of euros, figures like 40 million euros worth of fraud in, in laundry has been put out there by, by, some, um, uh, invest, by, by some journalists who have investigated this whole area. So I'd just like to know if the Criminal Assets Bureau have been involved and if they have made any seizures as a result of um, work that you, you have been doing. Deputy Kenny, Kenny uh, raised the question about the estimated loss of, of revenue from really from the diesel fraud and I think what I said before um, is that with any illegal activity there's a huge difficulty in estimating the cost of the exchequer. We're, we're able to have a stab at it in relation to illegal tobacco on the basis of surveys that are conducted about the packets people have and, and, and where they got them from. Um, so we're able to come up with a kind of a, a notional loss of the exchequer in relation to tobacco. In relation to most other areas where there's a, a degree of, of non-compliance or tax fraud, there's actually not very solid ways of coming up with satisfactory estimates. So I, I'm afraid I'm not able to say that, that, that we've got one of what, it, what it's cost us over the years. We're doing some work at the moment on the basis of the the increased revenues, the increased legitimate consumption that we're seeing and the increased revenues um, that are flowing from, from diesel consumption in the past couple of years. Um, and and it, if that amounts to something, we'll, we'll publish it. But as things stand, we're not able to, to put an estimate on, on, on what the cost is. Um, you mentioned the, the organized crime groups um, and with paramilitary um, connections. Yes, they they exist and they're, they're a big part of the problem um, and it's for that reason um, that we do have um, you know very well developed very solid working relationships um, with the Gardaí, with CAB, with the PSNI and with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs in, in Northern Ireland also. So um, we have that, there's a, I mentioned before there's the cross-border fuel fraud group there's also a, a cross-border um, tobacco fraud group as well. So these are being tackled. There's forums for sharing of intelligence um, in relation to individual targets, and all of that work proceeds. Um, and CAB is very much uh, a key player in targeting the organized crime groups. And that happens as a matter of course. Now, I don't have figures for what CAB. CAB published their annual report every year, and the assets that they would seize are the tax assessments that they would raise on figures in organized crime groups. 
you know, they're not going to be attributable to particular areas of activity that they've got. They just pursue them on, on right across the spectrum of their activities and, and, and go after whatever assets um, or income that they can find. But just to, to reassure you, CAB are, are a crucial part of the, the machinery of the, the state in, in tackling organised crime groups and, and I would say are, are, are very successful in doing that. Um, in terms of penalties, um, those, those are raised by, by you know, a number of people. In terms of the, the actual penalties that we've got on, on, a, on a summary conviction, the, fine, the maximum fine is €5,000 um, and or um, a term of imprisonment not exceeding 12 months. Um, on conviction on indictment, maximum fine of €126,970. Um, and or a custodial sentence not exceeding five years. Now, in, in practice, um, we've been getting rather modest court fines because what happens, what seems to happen, is that when we proceed with um, an indictable offence, with an indictable prosecution, um, you will either you will get a custodial sentence, although it may be suspended in many cases. So. Um, just looking at the total, we've had five people sentenced for, for fuel fraud crimes. We've had two custodial sentences and three suspended sentences. And in those cases, my understanding is that there haven't actually been any fines imposed. That what happens if they're giving a custodial sentence, whether or not suspended, that there isn't a fine. And the other fines then that we've got are where there's a summary prosecution and the average fine that we're getting in those cases is around about two and a half thousand euro. In terms of how we proceed, um, if there's evidence for a prosecution, we'll take a prosecution. But a lot of our activity, as I said earlier, and that's where this business of dealing with um, the 130 um, filling stations and indeed our ongoing challenging of traders, whether it's filling stations or whether it's suppliers, it proceeds on the basis of them, their compliance with the, license, with the law, number one, with the requirement to keep records um, and, and comply with licensing conditions. So, in relation to the filling stations that we would close, it wouldn't be necessarily because we've discovered that there's a prosecutable offence there or an offence as such. What we are discovering is that they're not satisfying the conditions of their licence and therefore we withdraw the licence. And if they continue to trade, which and we've done, that's where a lot of the seizures of fuel came, we've gone in and we pump out that filling station or we pump out that trader. So we go and seize the product. So really, as a, as a tool for tackling problems in the sector, licensing is the key, and, 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 and um, some of the, and the deputies do attention to how, how significant that is. And that's been our approach as well. We recognize that that's key. So what we want to do is to have stringent conditions attaching to all of the players in the sector, and what we have to do is to pursue them, and where they're not meeting those conditions, we're very aggressive in seeking to have their license revoked. Now, I said, we've had some pushback on this. And, and as a result of that, what we've had to do is strengthen the primary legislation to clarify. Now, we'll be where we've had pushback, we're appealing to the Supreme Court. But in the meantime, we're strengthening the primary legislation to clarify the grounds that we have to take on operators that aren't meeting the standards that are prescribed in excise law and that are attached to their license. Okay, Chairman, just ask one specific question. How many, if any, of the 130 stations uh, were closed because it was 